our dear viewers and listeners. We greet you in the mighty and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yet again, this is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad. As we open up today's Bible study, let's begin with the word of prayer. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for such a wonderful opportunity. We yield to the teaching of the Spirit. We yield to your guidance. We yield to your authority. Yes, for there is no name given among men whereby salvation can be attained, yes, but in the name of Jesus Christ. Even today, Lord, we come to thank you. We come before you that you might use us in this generation to share your word, yes, your grace, your love, yes, your peace, yes, your forgiveness yes, to this world. Have your way in us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Our dear viewers, we continue from where we ended last week. Having explained the three main category characters that we saw in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. Who are the woman, the child, and then the serpent. No musota. And with that understanding, I want us to reflect on a few things that, that happen to us in the day-to-day -day activity. I want us to look at the phrases that we often use, which have the word devil in them. And there are so many of them. And we fail to reflect on a few things. Why is such an occurrence so common to us? Phrases like the devil is in the details. Phrases like idle hands are the devil's workshop. Phrases like if the devil can't make you bad. Then he will make you busy. Phrases like better the devil you know than the angel that you don't know. Phrases like speak of the devil and there he shows up. Why do we use such phrases? And even amongst the Christian community. And it doesn't dawn on us that every now and then we are calling on a spiritual power. And we don't even have an understanding of what we are doing. Because it is one of the strategies of the devil. He wants to hide. But hide in plain sight. He wants his activities to have impact. Yet not be directly pointed to him. And it is all over the place. It is in our language, it is in our culture, it is in our behavior. And we don't never stop to reflect. Why is all this attention happening? Now I'd like to point you out to two dangerous schools of thought. That often happen with us. One is the school of thought that the devil doesn't exist. So everything bad and evil is due to the decisions that we make. That is a dangerous school of thought. The other extreme is to appropriate everything. 
both real and imagined to the work of the devil. That removes the responsibility of what we ought to do. And it is another extreme as well. Now there are several myths that have come up in the recent times concerning who the devil is. And I will point out three of them. Number one, the myth that the devil is of a certain color. Usually red or black with horns with a tail that looks like that of a, a horse and in some pictures with a fork. And that's not him. Actually, the Bible does not give us a description of how he looks like. And that is largely due to our imagination, which often is corrupted. For the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14 that this devil can must carried as an angel of light. So if you have that understanding, then it doesn't even matter how he looks like. Whether he shows up as an angel of light or in any other form, it does not matter. He is still the devil. Now the second myth is that the devil is in hell and he rules over hell. Now, hell is not the devil's palace. Hell is the place where the devil and his angels will have their eternal dwelling as a punishment. So he doesn't rule in hell. Currently he's not in hell. The Bible quotes him as the prince of the power of the air. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2 in Ephesians chapter 6, he's the leader of the spiritual forces of wickedness in the high places. So as we speak currently, he is not in hell. And I want that to register in your mind. Now the third myth that we often meet is the myth that the devil is God's exact opposite. Now, the devil is a creation. The devil is not a creator. Yes, he may try to oppose the agenda of God. Yes, he may be a key principle with regard to unveiling unrighteousness and sin and a pride and everything that is against what God has described for mankind. But he does not fight God as an equal. Although he wants us to believe that he is an equal to God. As a matter of fact, he does only what is according to God's plan. All God's ultimate purposes. So why is that so? And that's what our text today will point us to. This is what the Bible says. And we take our reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 12, from verse 7 to verse 12. And this is what the Bible says. And the war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. 
Mikael neva malaika be neva ruana no gusota. And the dragon and his angels fought. No gusota omu neva malaika ba guo neva ruana. But they did not prevail. So teva yinza. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Ni wata la vika chifocha wena temu guru. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives to the death therefore rejoice O heavens and you who dwell in them what the inhabitants of the earth and the sea for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time this text opens our understanding to a new dimension of where warfare actually happens in the heavenly places. The Bible tells us that war broke out in heaven. So our understanding is many of the struggles that we see on earth the str are struggles be between heavenly and earthly elements. The struggle between good and bad. The flesh and the spirit has got an origin. And this is what we read about from verse 7 to verse 9. Here we see the angels that have allegiance to the devil engage in war with the other angels that are, have allegiance to God. And they are led by Angel Michael. Now the Bible does not tell us how angels fight. And where the Bible is silent. I am of the view that we leave the matter to rest. The Bible doesn't tell us what weapons they use. What the Bible has revealed to us is that there was a conflict in heaven. And we had two warring parties. One on the side of God. Led by Angel Michael. And the other led by Satan and his angels. And the Bible says that the devil and his angels fought. But they did not prevail. In other words, they lost the war. In other words, they were defeated. In other words, at the end of it all, God won. And they were cast on the earth. Now that's very important. Because the person that you are facing or the devil that you meet every day of your life and are in constant conflict with has been defeated. 
He was defeated in that heavenly world. When Jesus came on earth, God put on flesh and he defeated the devil. We have an account him defeating the devil. When he was led into the wilderness, the devil shows up. Why does he show up? Because he comes with an agenda to distract him from fulfilling the purpose for which he came down on earth. And having failed in tempting him, the Bible tells us he left him for a while. And time and again in the ministry of Jesus Christ, the devil still reared his head somewhere. We see him move in the lives of the Jews to try and push them to kill him. And Jesus paints a picture for us in John chapter 8 and verse 44. He says this devil he was a murderer from the beginning. So he has not just begun killing. Jesus paints the picture for us that it is he that is responsible for the human loss of life from the very beginning that I reveals to us that he was the influence that brought Cain to kill his brother Abel. He also tells us he is a liar and he is the father of all liars. We go back again to the beginning in Genesis. When the serpent showed up in the garden, that tells us he was there within the serpent bringing are trying to bring about the fulfillment of his purpose to ensure that mankind's destiny has been cut short. And we as believers today need to understand that he has been around for a very long time. His strategies have been there. And if we are not careful, and if we don't walk by the Spirit, and if we don't allow the Spirit of the God to guide us, we will end up being powerless to what the enemy is planning against us. The Bible tells us Bible gamba, that greater is he that is in us than the devil that is out in the world. The scripture is pointing out to you and me that from earth's standpoint we have the upper hand because we have one in us who is greater than the one against us. So you have the potential. You have within you the ability to be able to overcome. Now, in this text that we read, verse 10 tells us of how he does what he does. He paints him as an accuser. He paints him as one who utters falsehood. You are wise Paints him as a liar. Mulimba. So he's an accuser. So katiemu wa of us. A wa before the heaven. Mumaso gaka tunda. But he's also. Naya he also comes down. Iraka wansi. To utter falsehoods to us concerning God and his character and his person. He has various schemes and we need to be aware of how he does what he does. Lest we become victims of his traps. Jesus painted it this way. He painted a picture of 
a garden where wheat was planted and then while men slept somebody came and planted tears so some things he will do unaware why? Because men choose to go to sleep. And when they wake up, it is too late. So we need to understand what he is doing and how he's doing what he's doing. And, and be in position to wage a war to wage a battle that is successful against the schemes he has against us. Now back to the text that we read. A lot has been made about when this war broke out. And we get so much concerned about when did this actually happen. And we have several schools of thought. There are those who hold that it happened before Genesis 1. There are others who hold that it happens between Genesis 1 verse 1 and verse 2. Right Others hold that it happened at the time before Job. Others say it happened before Zechariah chapter 3. Others hold that it happened at the, at the time when the Bible describes in Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12. Or Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 15. Then there are others who say no, it happened in the New Testament. After Jesus' temptation. Others say no, it did not happen at that time. It happened during the time when Jesus sent out the 70. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 18. When he said, I saw the devil fall down. And therefore he gave them power. Others still believe it happened at the triumphant entry. According to John chapter 12 and verse 31. And others say it happened after the resurrection. According to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8. And Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. Whichever, so you ask me which is which. And other say it will happen at the end. The point is this. In the end. Jesus wins. That's what I want you to be certain about. Whether it is in the future or the past, there is a finality about this text. Even if we hold that it is in the future, when you read the text, it leaves you no doubt about how his end is going to come about. It doesn't leave you with any doubt that there will, there will be no surprises whatsoever. The Bible is very explicit in explaining how these events happened and how he was cast down from heaven on the and what his mission on earth is understanding that the time he has is limited. You see when somebody is acting upon limited time. They do want to achieve so much in so short a time. So we need to understand that the devil is defeated. 
Tisitani ya wangu lwa. And that on earth era kunsi you are facing a defeated foe. Olwana no munte ya wangu lwa da. Now I want to ask a question another question that has been asked who is Michael? Now to many people it is obvious. Abasinga mujimani. You, you hear about Angel Michael. But that is if you have not faced the Jehovah's Witness. Because they believe that Jesus Christ Jesus Christ reincarnated as Angel Michael. So Jesus and Michael are the same. Which is a false teaching. And that is why I bring it to your attention. Today. The Bible tells us in Jude 9 that Angel Michael and the devil contended for the body of Moses. Now look at what happens in that text. This is what Angel Michael told the devil. He told the devil, the Lord rebuke you. If Angel Michael was the was Jesus, was the Lord, Mukama wa would have said I rebuke you. But that's not what it said. I mean we need to go back to the text and read it. Today you take and allow the word of God. To gaje chigambo cha katon. To inform our understanding of the affairs that we are living in. We see him in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Again, he is brought to us as the guardian of the Jewish nation. So we see him as a warrior. Because in Daniel chapter 10, from verse 13 to 21, we again see him fighting against the agents of the devil in the heavenly places. Now that should rest the matter that Angel Michael is not Jesus Christ. He is a creation and Jesus is a creator. Praise be to God. Now I want you to understand how does the devil, how is he able to be so successful in what he does? Or what is his agenda? His agenda is to paint a distorted view of who God is. Now that began in the beginning in the garden. When he comes to the woman, his first question to humanity Did God really say? And that is the question he keeps planting in our mind. Did God really say that? Are you sure? Why? Because then that points to the integrity of God. God and his word are inseparable. The Bible tells us he follows his word to perform it. He cannot go against his word. If he has spoken something, he will bring it to pass. Now, when we read about what God has said, we then need to view ourselves in light of what God has said. When we cast doubt on what God has said, we are not far away from where the woman was in the garden. The moment we begin to hear, has God really said? Then we are near and near to the downfall. And we need to be observant of that. You see, 
He not only paints a picture of who God is. That is distorted. But he also looks at Jesus Christ. And he paints to us that distorted picture of who Jesus is. So when many people today are asked concerning Jesus Christ, many will say he is a respectable man. He was a good man. He happened just to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, he, he, he was a person very highly respected. They that falls short. Jesus was not just a good man. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yesu Kristo ye mwana wa katonda He is the word made flesh. Ye kigambo e chamba ndobu bidi. God in the flesh. Ye katonda mu mubiri. Praise be to God. Kama feva And we should not lose sight of that. E cho de tujia ko maso ga fi. He's not one of the prophets. Siyo muku banabi. Ah ah. Nekda. He is God. Ye katonda. And you should be persuaded of that truth. Na we cho chikirize o matizi bwe. Any picture short of who Jesus is. Then who you are now we got becomes a misrepresentation. Your purpose in life becomes a misrepresentation. So everything about you about your destiny once you lose sight of who the Messiah is then you have lost your purpose in life no wonder today there are so many people you look at as successful in the various aspects and circumstances of life People will look at and say, yes, they have made it. Yet their lives are purposeless. Because of one thing, Jesus Jesus came to die for our sins. And when we fail to understand that, he did not just die. He was buried. And on the third day, he rose again from the dead. That is the complete story. That is what gives you and me victory. And the Bible in this text in verse 11 gives us three ways in which we can overcome him. For the Bible says they overcame him. In other words, he lays for you the strategy as to how you and I can overcome it. The first way in which we overcome him. The Bible says they overcame him by the blood. In other words, we faith overcome the devil when we trust in the blood of Jesus Christ. When we appropriate the shed blood and claim it for ourselves. When we understand that Jesus yes, did not die for himself. He died for us. And because of his blood, we have eternal victory over sin. We have victory over death. We have victory over hell. We have victory over the grave. We have all our shame all our guilt all our sin are washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ 
For the Bible tells us without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. In him the Bible says we have redemption through his blood. And it is through his blood that you and I have been purchased. It is through his blood that you and I can now stand before God without any guilt, without any shame, with our sins washed away. And that's what what the Bible talks about us being justified by faith. And that's what the Bible says that once we have been justified, the Bible says then who can condemn those that he has justified saints of God when the Bible says let the redeemed of the Lord say so we are speaking from a point of understanding that it is not by our efforts that we stand righteous before him it is by the shed blood of Jesus Christ it is through his blood and because of his blood that now we can approach the throne of grace and mercy and obtain mercy and obtain grace to help us in our time of need. It is because of the blood that you and I that have believed on him can now be called the children of the most high. Without the blood of Jesus, you cannot be called a son of God. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, you cannot be a daughter of the most high. I have had so many people say all of us are the children of God. And I'm, I'm searching the scriptures to find where they are getting that. The Bible says in John chapter 1 that as many received him to them he gave the power to them he gave the authority to be called the sons of God. So it is those that have believed on him that have that right to stand before God as his children. Where does that put you that is watching us, that is listening to us? Have you come to that place of faith? It is not what you do. Uh-huh. It is not the works that you do. We are saved by grace through faith. Not of works lest any man should boast. It is by faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ and he should now I've, I've met a lot of people who you see there are things we get so much conversant with. We forget that it is the blood that washes our sin. So we end up putting it on cars, on goats, on chicken and everything. We need to understand what the blood has done. Jesus came to die. For our sins. He did not come to die for your chicken. That's not what the Bible says. So don't appropriate the blood. Don't appropriate it to cars. He did not come to die for cars. He came to die for our sins. He did not come to die for our houses. He came to die for you and I. Don't forget that. The second thing, how they came to overcome him. The Bible says they came, overcame him by the word of their testimony. So, how do you overcome the devil? By telling your story. 
Now this is something many of us overlook. But everyone that has been graciously redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Everyone that has been graciously saved has a story to tell. Yes, I understand some stories are more dramatic than others. Yes, your story may not have you coming off your high horse and falling down in the middle of the road at noon. Like it was to Saul. But you have a story to tell. You are not who you used to be. Yes, there are some things that you believed God for and have not yet come to pass. But that is not what we are talking about. When you are talking of your testimony, you are like this man we meet in the gospel according to John chapter 9. When he meets the Jews. And so what do you have to say about this man? Referring to Jesus. He said, this is what I know. I was blind. But now I see. This is what has happened to me. And such a testimony. See, it is not at the liberty of Theology cannot explain this. But uh-huh. somebody may try and try and explain, but nothing can explain your experience. This is what happened to me. When I met Jesus, I was a wreck. The person that you rejoice seeing and hearing. I am what I am because of what Jesus has done in my life. Such a testimony cannot be counted. Everyone that has been graciously saved has a testimony has a story to tell you see when we go about telling people what God has done we need to be very clear of what has happened to us what is your personal testimony we, you get a we, we get lost when we are evangelizing to the lost we, we go to uh, try and explain certain words that we don't quite understand. We are trying to speak things that are mysterious to the ears of the believer. Oh. Uh, sorry, to the ears of the non-believer. Now you're going to them and trying to explain. Now this is what it is in Greek. Now, when you interpret it, you're wasting a lot of time. I don't understand Greek. I don't understand. Tell me what has Jesus done in your life? Let's start with that. Let that be your testimony. Let that be the story that you are telling the people out there. Like I said, and I will say it again. Everyone, irrespective of rank, irrespective of age, irrespective of reputation, you may have an education you may not have, irrespective of your background, if you have been graciously saved by Jesus Christ, you have a story to tell. And when the devil throws arrows at you, that shield of faith that you raise is the word of your testimony. This is what Jesus has done in my life. You see, experience cannot be counted. If I said this is what he has done, how are you going to counter it? There is no argument that can come against it. You see, in one sense, there is no answer to a personal testimony. 
Eriyo cha kudamu eriyo muntu cha isi. In another sense, munda benda. No one can deny what happened to you. Teri munda somola kuega nechi cha kuba. And this is what the Bible says. You know Bible che to gaba. As the third weapon that he used. Ye joko ranse joko sa tuche tuko zisa. The Bible says they did not love their lives. Ega ba teba ya galabula mubwa we. So as to shrink from them. O o o o o o Say what is that now? Let me explain. One of the weapons the enemy has placed in the lives of people is the fear of death. We sit today when I look at so many people when they gain a certain level of Prominence. The first areas they invest in is security. Why security? Because they fear to die. So much investment is around security, defense. That is a testament that death is still the number one thing crowding the lives of many people. But that should not be so to a believer in Jesus Christ. Here he is trying to tell us don't fall for the words of fears. You see, the application of this is that we should be willing to give up everything. We should be willing to give up anything but Jesus Christ. We should come to a place in our lives where our life is more about honoring Jesus Christ than our possessions. Where our lives is more about honoring Jesus Christ than our status in life. Than our, where we come to a place where our lives are more about honoring the Lord Jesus Christ than even life itself. You see, Jesus paints us the picture in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8 when he quotes Isaiah 29, 13 look at what he says. He says, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. So, look at what he's trying to say here. And he goes on to say, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He is trying to say, when it comes to worship, it is not about what we say. It is about our heart. It is about your life. In other words, your life should be surrendered to him. It's not about the lips. Yes, sing praise to him. But the question is, where is your heart? Is it surrendered to him? See, you cannot be an overcomer of the devil when your heart is in the devil's custody. You cannot be an overcomer when your life is not surrendered to Jesus Christ. You cannot be an overcomer of the devil if you have not come to that place of saying, Lord, I surrender my life to you. And if you have not come to that place, you are still far away from becoming an overcomer in Jesus Christ. You see, it is apparent to those who overcome that nothing is more worth than Christ's presence in their 
Jesus. When we talk about the presence of Christ, we understand God is everywhere. But I am talking about you having an experience. That when you begin to talk about God, you are not regurgitating somebody's experience. You are speaking about him who you have known. Him who you have encountered. You have a personal experience. That you resonate with Paul. That when I saw the vision. I was not disobedient. This encounter changed my life. That Jesus becomes real to you. You see, the scriptures, when we read them, should point us to the person of Jesus Christ. Short of that, we miss the picture. When it comes to the book of Revelation, we miss the book entirely. We begin to argue about things that are not important. And the things that are important are the things that we overlook. Now there is a question that has been asked. That if the devil is a defeated enemy, and is ultimately constrained according to God's plan. Do we need to know anything about Satan in order to live victoriously? Another one has put it this way. He says, why does the understanding of the reality of the evil one matter? It matters. Why? Because we acknowledge who our true enemy is. We recognize his strategies. And this is critical in fighting him effectively. In the war that Jesus has won for us. You see, if we fail to identify who the enemy is, then we focus on the wrong party. I've told you before that, that the devil's strategy is to hide in plain sight. So you end up fighting the wrong person. You end up fighting the wrong entity. If we don't understand that, then we just go hitting around all over the place. We find ourselves blaming people. And they are not the problem. <laughs> the real master of it all is hiding right there in plain sight. We point our weapons to the wrong thing. We apply the wrong weapons. In office. Why? Because we have failed to identify who the actual enemy is. I never forget the time I went for a mission. And people were getting out machine guns to fire against the devil. Seriously? And that's what they are doing. That level of ignorance. And they think we are engaging in warfare. You see, the weapons Jesus has given us are the weapons we should be using. Short of that, it demonstrates that we don't believe that Jesus is who he says he is. We, we don't believe he's the Lord of hosts. We don't believe he's the captain of the armies of heaven. This is what he tells you to use. When you use something else, you're saying, I don't believe you. Because 
Short of that, if we don't understand the plans of the devil, we end up trusting politics. We end up trusting programs. We make our fight an earthly one. Our fights become fights of words. Battles of finances. Battles of manipulation. Battles of egos. Things of the like is what we fight in. And it, it is so petty. Why? Because we have failed to understand this truth. God wants us to remind ourselves constantly that whereas the war is won, we still have battles to fight. And we can only be victorious when we fight them His way. We continue with that note next week. But if you have never given your life to Jesus, you cannot cannot be victorious in this battle. It begins by you surrendering to the winning side. By surrendering your life to Jesus. And ask him to wash his blood you with his blood to cleanse you of your guilt to wash away your sin and to make you a child of the most high so if you are there and you have never received Jesus let's pray Father in the name of Jesus there is that one watching you who has a conviction in his heart. That one with the conviction in her heart. Lord, I pray that right now as they surrender their lives to you, fill them with your Holy Spirit. Baptize them. Empower them to live their lives for you. Everyone will have a testimony with which to overcome the devil. That they will live this life triumphant to the very end. Therefore, if you are saying this prayer for the first time, say, Father, I am a sinner. I need a savior. Jesus, Jesus, come into my life. Save me of my sin. Change my purpose. Change my direction. Empower me to live for you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. You have been wonderfully saved. If you are struggling with anything, the war has been won. In Jesus Christ, you can overcome. So I'm going to pray with you as well. It is a short prayer. But God will come in your life. He will empower you. And you are going to have a testimony of God's triumph in your affairs. Lord Jesus, I thank you that there is nothing too hard for you. Right now, Lord, for that man, for that woman, for that child, that is powerless that needs help that needs your intervention that seems lost that has no direction I pray in the name of Jesus Christ the son of the living God that you empower them to overcome we pray for that miracle in their lives be it a healing that they need we speak healing to their situation healing to their broken circumstances restoration to their fortunes bless them Lord in the mighty name of Jesus Christ the son of the living Amen now God has done something Therefore, there is that number on the screen. Please give us a call. Share your testimony.
tuburi do julizi bo and let us rejoice tujago nyine tuleko je wamu with what god is doing nebyo katonda byakola bwalamu so till we meet again paka we tuddamo kusisinga to the church kuva mu dominion church we say god richly bless you mukama bawo mukisha shalom mirembe Thank you.